Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking to you about sort of a normie approach to validating LLM outputs. As my title of the presentation uh, starts, you might have had a long day. I think that this presentation is going to be pretty light, um, and but hopefully very applicable. And perhaps maybe you'll even take a few tricks of the trade with you after this, this talk. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Ben Labashian. I'm Principal Machine Learning Engineer at Work Helix. Um, I primarily work with large language models and agents. Um, I recently actually wrote a report on AI agents and LLM, uh, and LLMs in general for O'Reilly. So um, it's pretty topical that I'm talking about this right now. Uh, and you know, I think the first thing I'll say is that um, I want to talk a little bit about why this even matters, what the conversation we're having here. Uh, I, I think that there's so much happening in this space, and people have probably made this, shared this sentiment before, but I'm going to share it from my own heart. Um, there's so much happening in this space that you might find it hard to keep up. Um, and my philosophy in data science and machine learning for quite some time has been there's no point of trying to be at the bleeding edge unless you want to be the person who is literally developing those bleeding edge tools the stuff that's going to be useful to me usually gets to me within a day or two, a week, you know, a month, and, and everything else that turns out to have been nothing can kind of trickle down. But there are foundational approaches that have been around for quite some time. You might even call this the Lindy effect, right? Something that is old and that has, is still around is likely to be around a lot longer than something that is new uh, that hasn't been around for a very long time. And so I like to take those that kind of perspective. People kind of call it normie now. You might have heard of Vicky Boykis. She talks about normie approaches to to software uh, tools, and I, I really appreciate that. Appreciate that kind of perspective, and I think it can be applied to large language models. Um, so why do we need to validate LLM outputs in the first place? Of course, you know there's quantized LLMs, and you know you want to might you might be working for with a very small LLM on your local computer, and it's just going to be lower quality. And so, what are you going to? How are you going to deal with the fact that this is a smaller model, um, or maybe it's just a regular model and it's stochastic? We'll be getting back to that for quite some, quite often, uh, in this presentation. Another thing to say is that, like m many of these open source models, might not have like refined OpenAI like function calling APIs. So, what do you do in those situations when you want a JSON? And it doesn't return a JSON, right? Uh, we, I think, we need to sort of have a strategy for that, especially as data scientists, machine learning engineers, developers, etc. Um, and you know, even when they do, as I said, these models are still, by their definition, stochastic and generative, and so they're going to return something that we can't quite anticipate. Often, what do you do in those situations? Even OpenAI models don't always return JSONs. What do you, what do, you do about that? So there are some solutions, and people have talked about them throughout the day. But you know, I'll just mention some. There's monitoring embeddings drift. You could like embed the output and uh, track them over time. You can do A/B testing, um, or you can do human evaluation. You can just look at the output and just say this works or it doesn't work. Right? These all have their pros and cons. They all have their place. Uh, but as an engineer, I kind of take my perspective of like sometimes I just want the thing to work. I just want the thing I'm building to work. I will get to a nice, beautiful production grade pipeline that will, no one will have complaints about and it have all the bells and whistles. But sometimes I would really like to just get what I need and then go from there. And, and ideally, those strategies are normy. And that is that they are enduring. They're, some, they're a strategy I can pull from another place in my life or another place of. If, software development that I'm familiar with. So uh, I want to try something cheap as well, right? I want it not to be super taxing, either you know, emotionally, mentally, intellectually, et cetera. OK, so for this presentation, I want to sort of demonstrate some of those, those approaches. So I built a chat bot for excuse me, this, um, this, this presentation. I didn't build the actual LLM, but I, I built an interactive chat bot, which I can demonstrate towards the end of the presentation. All right, so this chat bot is built using Llama 2, which is pretty powerful. Um, all of us are probably familiar with it at this point. Um, 
except that it's a quantized version. So it's not even the full thing because I'm just doing it on my local laptop and there's gonna be, you know, less quality. Um, and actually got an error message from the chatbot. Um, and so this this is what's going on here, right? I don't, why, why is there an error message? Does the LLM send me an error message? No, it doesn't. Like it's not gonna say error. It's gonna return some nonsense perhaps. And so what happened here is actually exactly what I wanted. I caught something I didn't want because it wasn't in the format that I pre-specified. Okay, so what am I talking about here? So here's some code. Don't go blind. It's okay. It's gonna be it's gonna be fine. I'll break it down for you. It's pretty pretty simple when you break it down, and you don't have to understand each line of code here. I'll walk us through it. So the chatbot code pretty much starts like this. You've got this agent. You're just gonna call it agent, and there's this this class that I built called start agent or this function that I built that, that's called start agent. And it, it responds from this agent API that um, is actually communicating to a language model somewhere else on my computer. Great. And basically I ask the user for a response. I say, okay, you know, communicate with me. And then when I get a response in one of the rare instances where I actually use a walrus operator, um, I get the response and then I show the user that they just submitted a response. I have received your response. But then what's this stuff down here? This is this thing that basically is gonna be the rest of the presentation. There's this process user input uh, function and then there's this agent.respond method thing going on here. So what is this? This is my validation magic. This is what I'm gonna be talking about. So what's going on? Well, first let's talk about it in this way. The problem with large language models and quantized models, as I've said, is that they're stochastic. But there's something we can do even though they're stochastic. Just because something is random doesn't mean we don't have sort of a line of defense. What am I talking about? Well, we could actually force the model to return what we want. And if it's not what we want, we say, go back and do it again. It may not be the most um, latent free approach, but sometimes it actually does the trick pretty well. And so the way that I do this in this presentation and in, in my real life when I just need things to work the way I want it for, to work is I use the magic of Pydantic and while loops just as a, a little bit of flavoring. All right, what are these things? What am I talking about? So let's go back to the the, the response method from before and then uh, I'll, I'll walk you through what, what I actually do. So I get this, uh, this little dictionary here and it just says, okay, communicate with Llama2, send this prompt to Llama2 uh, there's this idea of like, you can return the format in JSON, but that's kind of laughable as we'll see, and then some settings. And then what I do is I, I send a post request uh, to, to the agent. I say, here's the data, uh, give me a response. And, and then if you go further down into the, you know, into the code, uh, if it returns a 200, if there's not an actual error with the program itself, then I will try to parse the API response that I got using this validation class. And so there's a first initial uh, validation class called chat API response. And this is what basically the chat API response anticipates. And how do I know what it should anticipate? Well, because the model I'm using is using um, the Olama library and Olama has a JSON that their models return. And this is what was expected. And so I built this pydantic base model out of what is expected. So everything that you see here, you also will see here. That's basically it. You don't need to go line by line. I can promise you it's it's gonna be the same. Um, and so after this, you know, uh, chat API response based model class is applied to the JSONified response from the model, I get this right here, which is basically saying this was parsed. This was parsed correctly. What we expected is what we got, which is great. Okay, so far so good, but that's not entirely it because how come I got an error then, right? It says, hey, how can I assist you today? Hey, good morning, error message content not found. What's happening here though? I thought we said that we just solved that problem. Well, let's look at our uh, output from, from our logs. And it turns out that the chat API response field, good morning is the key. And then there's a colon and it says, thank you. It's nice to hear from you. How are you today? That's sort of an unanticipated. I didn't expect that key to be good morning. I don't know what that is. And that's returned this error message content not found. The API response that we saw earlier, this one right here, may be pre-known. This part is true because this is just pure programming. 
but the response from the model, which is, if you look in here, it actually says, uh, it's here, good morning, thank you, and stuff. That is fully stochastic. I could not anticipate that. What do we do? Well, actually, what you can do is you can hit your model a bunch of times just while you're testing and get a few different versions of some acceptable responses from your model. So in one base model class at the, the top, I receive a key value of message. In another one, I got type and text. In another one, I got result. In another one, I got response. And I said, OK, these are four different responses from the model that I'm, I'm content dealing with. And so what I did was I had a bunch of these pedantic base models, and I just took the response. And I loaded the response from the parsed API. First, I parsed it, and it was as I expected. But the, the message itself still needed to be parsed. So I put them through these base model classes, and I validated in this line, in this line, in this line, and in this line. And any time that it returns one of these four types of messages, I say, bully for me, go forth, and, and I, will, I will send your reply. But what the problem that was with that is we can't really build a base model for every possibility because there's just too many to anticipate, and some we just don't even want. So what do we do in those situations where, OK, Ben, but you're, you're making the claim that you should make a pedantic model for everything? I'm not, actually. So in a situation where you, you've gotten enough responses where you feel like these are the common responses that I accept, then you can just say, oh, all right, great, and anything else is a none. Well, what does that do? Well, what happens is if the error response is none, if my validation returns none, then I try again. I put that wild up there. It's very normy. I just say, OK, hit the model again. This time, ask them for a better response. And you can do some prompt engineering and all that type of stuff. But for right now, I just want to make sure that the, the messages I receive are something I can deal with. And now, we're not going to get any error response. Because instead of saying error content not found, we return none. We pass it to the while loop if it's none. And then we force the model to send a response again, and we get a perfectly fine conversation. Now, this doesn't say anything about the quality of the prompts. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the quality of the output. Certainly, there are many different methods to apply to those. But at the very simple level that I like, which is I want to ensure what I get is what I expect, and that I'm not going to have some crazy errors, this is a tried and true method. I use these for everything from llama type of like llama type models to mistral to chat gpt i still apply base models to them as well because even though there's function calling they sometimes don't uh, provide you what you expect and that can be very costly just as an example it's nice for this little chat bot but imagine a situation where you are generating training data and you need to ensure that the training data looks exactly as you expect um, then it's not fun and games. Then you really do need to ensure that the the structure is what you expect. And so using pedantic base models and something like a while loop or exceptions and try agains, whatever you need, can sometimes be that um, bulwark that you're looking for. So uh, that's what I do. I can show you very briefly this model if you want. It's right here. And I just say, hey. And then you know it's running. And things are great. And hey, it returns pretty quickly. So it it's not like it takes a long time when you're putting in these while loops, although of course there is the concern for latency. But at the point where you're surfing surfacing this to a user, I might suggest something other than a while loop. That's when I would st start suggesting something a little bit more um, timely, like prompt engineering and, and other fine-tuning methods. <laughs>